Hello everyone and welcome to Student Hub Live. You're here with me Rob Moore today and I'm one of the presenters on Student Hub Live and it's really good to see you all. Today we're going to be talking about one of those subjects which might cause you a bit of um, anxiety make you a bit uh, a bit cautious academic conduct but we've got some experts with us today with lots of advice to make sure that um, you understand what it is and give you some really good tips so today we've got some help with us in the chat we've got Ralph and Felicity with us and they're going to be answering your questions pointing you out to some <clears throat> resources that you can go to and uh, just giving you some tips as we go through the session. You'll notice uh, messages from Ralph and Felicity because they will have SHL in front of their names. So any messages from Ralph and Felicity are there to help guide you. And of course, I'm joined by my co-presenter Heidi today. Hi, Heidi, how are you today? Hi, I'm doing really well, thanks, Rob. How are you doing? I'm all right, I'm, I'm looking forward to this session. I've been looking forward to this one for a while. So. Who have we got with us today, Heidi, and what are they talking about already? Well, I'm going to start off with our international students first. So good morning to everyone that's in the chat and joining us today. I'd like to say a big hello to Ernest in South Africa, studying B100, which is an introduction to business and management, which I understand is one of your modules, Rob, which is great. Is. We've got Linda um, joining us from Canada, who's got up really early this morning to join us, which is lovely. And we've got Michael joining, I hope I pronounced that right, Michael or Mikhail uh, from China. So great to have you with us. Um, we've got Leisha. Leisha, lovely to have you back. I know you've joined a number of our Freshers events. You're joining us from Sunny Blue Skies in Colchester, Essex. Um, Beatrice from Bangor in Northern Ireland. Um, Grey skies, but quite warm for a change. We've got Anita in sunny Aberystwyth um, and Heather says, good morning, everyone. A bright sunny day. The leaves have not yet turned. Good for walking after the session today. Studying introduction to criminology. Fantastic. I did my master's in criminology, Heather. You're going to really enjoy that. Maisie says, I'm definitely going for a walk after this session, Heather, then taking my daughter pumpkin picking. So that's going to be really nice. And Jackie says, Morning from a sunny-ish Walsall, studying um, the access module Y034. And I'd like to say a big welcome to Emma because it's Emma's first time joining a Student Hub live session. So great to have you with us. We've got Claire watching from the Scottish Borders and we've got Tazzy Faith who says, Boridar everyone, coming to you from a grey Wales. Now, it's a busy show today. We've got lots of people in the chat. So if you are finding that it's moving quite quickly, in the top right hand side, there's a little pin. And if you click on that, it will slow the chat down for you. It's a godsend for me. I use it all the time so I can keep track of everything that's going on. And you'll see that we've got some nice widgets as well that you can play around with. So if you're joining us from the UK, you can pinpoint exactly where it is you're joining us from. And also please do let us know which module it is that you're studying. Um, so I'm just having a little look at the widget now to see. Now we've got lots of people who are studying psychology, which is great. So welcome to everyone. Lots of psychology, lots of counselling and lots of people studying primary education as well. So please do put your details in there of what module you're studying. Pop any questions that you've got at all in the chat. It's my job to put them to the panel. So any questions or concerns or anything you've got at all, you can pop them in. I'll save them. So just put them in at any point throughout the show and really enjoy it. Great to have you with us. Okay, thank you, Heidi. It's good to see so many people joining us from uh, around the world. And it's fantastic to see some of you who, this is your first time on Student Hub Live. So hopefully it won't be the last. We've got lots of events coming up throughout the year. So this discussion is split into three parts. We're going to start off by having a general discussion about what is meant by academic conduct. Then we're going to have a, another discussion about what are the rules and how do we make sure we adhere to them. And then we're going to finish the, um, the whole event off answering your questions. This is my favourite part where we, uh, we put the panel on the spot. So keep your questions coming through and Heidi will be putting them to the panel on your behalf. So I'd like to introduce my guests. We've got some fantastic guests today. Uh, we've got Jackie with us. Now, Jackie's the head of, school for, uh, head of school for learning and teaching, and she leads on academic conduct in the School of Education, Childhood, Youth and Sport. 
And she also co-chairs the Wells Faculty Academic Integrity Implementation Group. Now I've got to put my teeth back in after saying all of that. Uh, but no, Jackie is a real expert on about all things to do with academic conduct. Then we have Dean, who's a student experience manager and one of our academic conduct officers. And he's going to be explaining the role that he plays. And we're delighted to have Charlotte with us from USA. That's the OU Students Association. And Charlotte is a student advisor who helps uh, students who have issues. Uh, so in a whole range of things, but specifically she's going to be talking to us today about academic conduct. So hi guys, really great to have you with us today. Uh, there's a word cloud for you to fill in at the moment now. So we've changed from the original one. And what we want you to write down are the three words, uh, one word at a time, three words that you associate with the term academic conduct. So if you pop those into the word cloud, then um, Heidi will have a look at that when we've had this thought. So we're going to start off, and I'm going to come to Jackie first. Uh, Jackie, can you explain to us in, in simple terms, if you can, uh, what do we mean by academic conduct, and what is the role of the academic conduct officer? What do they do? Uh, morning, Rob. Um, academic conduct is very much to do with maintaining standards and it also links to academic integrity, which is uh, about uh, moral behaviour. Now, the role of the academic conduct officer has really developed over the years uh, across um, our school and across the faculty and indeed the university, because um, at one point it was much more about almost catching students out because what happens um, is we put all of our students work through software to look for high matches but what we have done within the school is really brought it back to the very beginning and looking at what we can do to prevent students being referred for investigation into academic conduct by an officer so if i can just go back even further if you think that when you're studying for your degree you will get credits from your each of your mod modules that you um, complete and this credit will build up to your final degree so you need we all need to be ensuring that what we are submitting in our assessments is our own work and that we are not either using other people's work um, and there is a whole different array of ways that other people's work um, can be used and we'll come on to that later. So the very uh, first principle is bearing in mind that whatever you are writing for your assessment should be in your own words. Now there can be a, there are a lot of students who can end up um, inadvertently um, or almost accidentally and do come in colleagues if, if you want to clarify my use of words here but they they can end up being investigated for um, academic uh, misconduct because perhaps they haven't yet developed the skills of writing in their own words paraphrasing including references and citations um, accurately within their work. Um, so we, we, we can talk about academic conduct as being good or bad. So when, what we're really looking for is students to be able to show what they know, what they're saying, and to separate it off from perhaps the sources that they've used. And uh, yeah, so, <laughs> I know when I was a student, going back, um, and of course we used to chisel into stone tablets when I was studying, um, but um, <laughs> uh, we almost treated the academic conduct as the police, they were out to get you, but that's definitely not the case, is it? What, what we're looking for is developing this skill. Um, now I'm on the other side yeah. of the fence as a tutor, it's very much about a skill that we develop with students as they come on. Uh, so, do we deal with academic conduct differently uh, at level one, at the entry level, to the way we deliver it at level three or perhaps postgraduate? 
Yeah, what we're aiming to do is ensure that students are, are directed um, towards the um, resources that they will find helpful. Um, I did some scholarship with our Praxis Centre, funded by our Praxis Centre and with colleagues um, within the faculty. And the title of the project is, uh, how can we support children, <laughs> children, I'm from early childhood, how can we support <laughs> students to develop good academic conduct? And we didn't get as good a response in in the terms of numbers of students um, coming forward but what we did find out was some really valuable lessons and what the students did tell us was that they would look at a whole range of sources the library um, the the VLE for their uh, module um, a whole range of different um, resources because not what one size doesn't fit everybody but what all of this students who participated said was that they would then want to come back to their tutor for that reassurance that what they were doing was correct. Now, in relation to level one students, um, why would we expect any level one student to come in with these skills? That's what you're here with us for. And we've all, as you said, Rob, we've all been through this, what can, what can feel like a bit of a painful process, learning about doing references. So my one real piece of advice would be to engage with the resources and work with your, your tutor in order to, um, and you need to invest that time really in developing the skills. It's like building the foundations moving forward. So um, what we're really doing with our level one students across the school, across the faculty, is just ensuring that we get that message out and that we're as supportive as we possibly can. Because what we don't want is, Un when I say unnecessary, it's actually inappropriate, I think, is the best word. Um, referrals made for investigation for students who may not have had um, much experience of uh, engagement with education in the past. Um, and, uh, and from my personal point of view, I only did my master's uh, when I was 40 or something and it was years since I had uh, done any um, education and I really struggled but I had to put the time in and then it's like a lot of things it's like learning to drive a car it suddenly clicks and you feel much more confident but it's about listening and getting feedback and um, certainly um, as a level one student we want every we want to support and prevent uh, students falling into um, being investigated for academic misconduct or not good conduct. Absolutely. And uh, it's, it's amazing to me where, when I have my students come in at level one, quite often I get panicked emails straight away in the first week about, oh, I don't know about referencing. How am I going to get it right? Am I going to lose marks for this? And the answer is always the same. Don't panic. This is new. This is something we're going to yeah. teach you, something we're going to help you develop. So take it easy. Listen to what we say. If you ignore us, <laughs> we'll have a problem maybe down the line. But listen to us, work with us, and we'll make sure you get it right. So I'd just like to go over to Heidi for a second. We've got the word cloud building up. So these are your, um, your thoughts on... Um, uh, what we mean by academic conduct. So Heidi, what are we hearing from people already? Are we getting uh, concerned emails or are people quite relaxed at the moment? Um, re yeah, I think we've got a little bit of a mix. Um, yeah, so I just am um, having a look at the word cloud here. So um, integrity, honesty, rules, plagiarism, respect. Um, so yeah, it's great to see people sharing their thoughts there. Please do have a little play around with the widgets. I just need to say, I've already had my first telling off of the day, Rob, from one of our students. <laughs> but I have to go back and apologize. So Dar um, it was from Daryl. I sincerely apologize. Apparently I pronounced Bangor incorrectly um, in Northern Ireland. I called it Bangor and it should be Bangor. So Daryl, my sincere apologies. Hopefully you can forgive me. Thank you for this teachable moment. So I will know how to pronounce it correctly in future. Um, we had a question from Teresa, Rob. Um, she says, I'm at work, so may miss some bits of today's session. Can I watch it again later? Yes, Teresa, you absolutely can. This will be made available again afterwards. Um, 
We do have a couple of questions that have come through, Rob, but I just want to quickly touch on some of the love that's coming through for your background. Um, so oh. Tina says, I need that room that's in Rob's background for sure. Um, Tony says, I really want that room. Uh, Leisha says, I love Rob's background, but not quite as cute as Heidi's dog. Um, and Leisha, oh, and, sorry, and Sophie said, Leisha, we need a background of Heidi's dog printed over and over again. So if you're new here, this is Martha <laughs> over my shoulder. And she is my dog, which I think some people think that I sedate because she doesn't move and she just sleeps the whole way through through but she's just absolutely ancient bless her um so yes i like to have martha with me she's my she's my little study buddy there she is on the screen little one-eyed martha unfortunately she lost one of her eyes she had to have it removed um she can't hear a thing she's completely deaf and she's completely riddled with arthritis she's my little street dog from cyprus that i had flown over about a year and a half ago and she's an absolute angel and delight so nice to share absolutely. our study buddies there um and then i do have a question rob are you okay for me to to pop a question to yeah, you yeah. And, and the panel? Have a question now. Lovely. Okay, so Heather says, um, do the references that we include in our assignments um, have to only be based on the module? Can we add others um, that's from outside of the module? Right. Well, if it's okay, I'm going to ask Dean to cover that particular answer when we move into that question. So, um, and then, because <laughs> I don't want to answer the question. I mean, that's why we've got a wonderful guest. <laughs> but I'm going to ask Dean to cover that as part of his answer in the next bit, if that's okay. Um, in which case, we're going to move on to the next question. Then. So this is going to go to Dean. Um, and what we want you to do now is... Uh, on the screen, you'll have a ticker question going across the bottom. What's your definition of the term plagiarism? So share your thoughts in the um, in the chat, and Heidi will give us some of your definitions there. So I'm going to bring Dean in, and Dean, if uh, I can ask you the question, what constitutes academic misconduct? Uh, what are the potential consequences? And if you can bring into that the answer to that question as well about module sources, do we only use module sources? Uh, so thank you, first of all, Rob, and great to see so many people here this morning, uh, which I would suggest is probably actually a good sign already, um, as we'll probably come on to a bit later. We tend to see, as Jackie's already alluded to, it's quite inadvertent um, plagiarism oftentimes that we're dealing with. So. It's usually, I'd say, the more astute students, if I can call everybody that here so far, um, that, yeah. that we tend not to see. So, um, yeah, to deal with a few things and just to touch on a further point as well. Um, Jackie explained that, you know, it's it, I think, can often be perceived as um, a negative, you know, dealing with academic conduct. You are, you are naturally dealing with um, disciplinaries, potentially investigations, um, breaches, potentially the rules. And, and it's... In my view, you know, even though I, I deal with this day to day, it can quite often be perceived as negative, whereby um, I think the message has to be that it's important to recognise what is indeed academic misconduct so that we know how to deal with it and know how to avoid it. But the aim actually is to develop good conduct, to develop good practice. Um, and in doing so, we want students to lean towards, you know, how, how can I be a good academic? How can I use my sources appropriately to, to gain good credit? rather than simply avoiding plagiarism. And because I think you've, you fall short somewhat and do yourself a disservice if it's simply about, you know, how can I just simply not do the wrong thing? How actually can I do the right thing and the better thing? So to touch on some of those questions then, Rob, and, and please do, you know, come in if I miss any points, but I'll particularly touch on the module uh, materials aspect as well. Um, so what is um, academic misconduct? Well, in, it can take various forms. Um, in its simplest, it's um, utilising or using the work from other sources, using other people's work or words or ideas and presenting them or passing them off as your own. Um, a couple of points just to raise there that is often, I think, a misconception among students. The idea of um, using the work of others and the idea then of presenting or passing off as your own. So briefly, just to touch on that, when we say using the work of others, it's students will often say something along the lines of, you know, this was my work. I wrote the assignment. I handed it in, etc. What we actually mean is within your assignment, when you're drawing on information from other sources, which is permissible, it's completely fine to go and use uh, material from other sources and to, to just bring that question in, whether that be module materials, whether it be other sources, um, it, it's acceptable to use material from other sources. Um, 
at different levels of study, you know, whether you should be using only modular materials or external sources, it kind of depends on the level of study and, and the nature of the assignment. Generally speaking, at level one, um, you only need to use module materials. You know, you, you won't necessarily gain further credit from going to external sources. Um, so it, it, as you progress through your studies, there is a bit more of an expectancy to go beyond simpler module materials, etc. So that's more of an academic question rather than whether you are allowed or permitted to use other sources. You can use any source in theory. Um, I say that somewhat loosely, but you can use any source. The issue with academic conduct and referencing is whether you are illustrating that usage to the reader. So to just go back again slightly on the, the, the using material from other sources, using other people's work, um, we don't necessarily mean there that you are literally using somebody else's assignment and handed it in, um, which I will come to shortly. Um, it's whenever within your assignment, you're using material from other sources. You know, you use this section from the module materials, you use this quote from this article, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the presenting or passing off as your own is where it's permissible to do that. But when you do that, as I've said before, you have to then illustrate that usage to the reader. So if I use this quote, I have to show the reader where I got this quote from. In the absence of doing so, the reader has to assume that that is my work, that's my material, because I've not said otherwise. And it's it's that where the plagiarism occurs. So it's acceptable for me to use material from other sources, but when I do so, I have to illustrate that usage to the reader so that they can tell apart, they can discern what is mine and what is the work of other sources. So to touch on just a couple of things that we uh, come across are various forms of academic misconduct. Um, and I'm mindful what the um, comments that the ticker question might be, so I don't want to give the answer away at this stage. People haven't addressed it, but um, let's say standard plagiarism. So using the work or ideas of others and presenting them or passing them off as your own. There's also uh, self-plagiarism. So you can actually plagiarize yourself, which a lot of students uh, don't realize, which takes essentially the same form that I'm in theory copying my work that I've I've previously done in the past on another module for example and not illustrating to the reader that i'm doing that um, there's also enabling plagiarism that's where i might make my work available to others um, enabling them to commit plagiarism a, a common form of that is where students might you know one student's really struggling that they've fallen behind with their studies for whatever reason and you know as a friend as a study buddy you give them some assistance, you give them the, your work for whatever reason, they then over rely on that, copy that, plagiarize that, and you've actually enabled that plagiarism. Um, so it's not simply the offense of just copying other people's work. It's also then the, the fact that you've, you've permitted that, you've enabled or you've shared your work for that to happen. Um, a more, more serious form, so, so stepping maybe away from inadvertent plagiarism is then where we might deal with cases of like contract cheating for example so you go to an essay mill of one of these essay companies they write your essay and you hand it in essentially and i know there's various forms of that sometimes students use resources to develop their own work but sometimes students will get an assignment written for them and hand that in essentially and those companies will say something along the lines of it's plagiarism free which essentially means that yes their assignment maybe plagiarism free in that they are acknowledging resources, etc., and other sources that they've used. Um, but when you hand that in, it's actually um, the plagiarism at that point. Mm -hmm. So various um, forms of academic misconduct, but <clears throat> yeah, the message just to reiterate again is we want to steer towards good conduct, not the bad conduct. Yeah, absolutely, Dean. And thank you for that. I think that was really clear running through the different forms and you're absolutely I totally agree with you about using module materials. See what you're expected to use, because definitely my level one students are expected to stick mainly within the module materials. My postgraduate students are expected to go mainly outside the module materials. So it depends what we're expecting you to do. And I know that Heidi's got quite a few pointers to bring in. So Heidi, what's, uh, what views are being shared with us in the chat at the moment? What are people saying? 
loads of definitions of plagiarism mm -hmm. coming in from our students, which is great to see. So Chantelle says, copying someone else's work. Iona, passing other people's work off as your own, um, which is what Ian said as well. <laughs> Interestingly, they both, mm -hmm. they both said the same thing. They didn't <laughs> copy each other, I promise. Um, <laughs> Kirsty says, um, cheating, copying. Um, Amber says, yeah. using someone else's ideas. Um, Lauren says, copyright. Richard says, claiming others' work as your own. Um, and then Sandra says, using somebody else's work without giving them credit. Yeah, that's the key thing. Mm -hmm. Sky says, um, using somebody else's ideas or work as if it were your own. Pauline says, not referencing. And Natasha Dawn says, not correctly referencing. Um, and then um, Carol says, using other people's work without acknowledgement. So yeah, lots of ideas being shared there. Did you want me to come back to the question, which I uh, I was a little bit too eager, wasn't I, Rob? And I asked the question no, for fine. Dean before he'd even come on the screen. So do you <laughs> want me to um, to ask that question again now? Is now a good time? Or are you going to move well, on and chat some more first? Is, is this the one about using module materials? Um, uh, it's, it's about reference. Yeah, yeah, that's oh, right. Yeah. So the, the simple thing is, uh, and, and we like to try and keep things as simple as possible. So when it comes to referencing module materials, you have paid to study an open university course. We are assessing your use of open university materials. So unless you are actually asked to go and find external sources, external arguments, etc., we are expecting most of your answers to come from the material you've been given. The absolute baseline for me of any pass assignment is evidence that the student has read the module. And one of the ways to demonstrate you've read it is to use module materials and reference it accurately. Um, and there's a lot more focus on that on the earlier levels of the, because uh, I'm in business and management, a um, lot more on those uh, early levels, whereas later on, when we get to the end of the degree, we're asking students to look for other, con um, not contradictory, but uh, contrasting arguments and ideas. And we might ask them to go and do some research, but they still need to come back and use it within the module content. So hopefully that's a, a big enough answer for that question. If not, we'll come back to it at the end. Um, so hopefully, Heidi, that, that will uh, cover that. I'm going to move on to the, uh, the question for Charlotte now. Um, so Charlotte, uh, in your role in USA, uh, you obviously have a lot of students who come to you who are concerned who might have been referred for an investigation. Can you tell us about your experiences of that and the sorts of things that you um, uh, advise students? Thank you, Rob. Um, yeah, so we do get a lot of students come to us with uh, plagiarism concerns. I think um, July was our busiest month. So um, just a very quick brief overview of the individual representation service that we offer at, uh, at the Students Association. It's been going since about November 21. Um, we realized that students needed support with um, academic misconduct cases or complaints and appeals against the university. Um, so my role as a student advisor is to support students through the uh, sort of policies and procedures that the university put in place. Um, so yeah, um, July, like I said, was probably our busiest month because a lot of students were contacting us because they had um, sort of pending results. They went to look at their results, expecting to see what they'd been given as a grade and see that their results were pending. Um, quite often they'll then receive an email from the university to say your results are being pended due to um, a possible plagiarism investigation. Um, as you can imagine, being a student, um, and I'm a student myself at the same time as working, um, it's, it's a terrifying prospect to be accused of plagiarism. Um, but obviously, as Jackie and Dean have been saying, it's not the university aren't there to catch you out. They're there just to make sure that the um, academic the conduct process is followed um, and that the students are doing the best work that they can do. So um, when students come to us, what we do is immediately say, it's okay, don't worry. Um, I know it sounds scary, but it isn't, you know, we'll get through this. So a lot of it is, um, is, is an emotional support as well, um, being a student advisor as well as sort of the practical side of things. Um, so we always suggest that students engage with the university's process um, so the university will 
um, most likely um, request that the student come back to them with an explanation of potentially how the plagiarism has occurred. Um, we always suggest that you, you um, engage with this because the university want to know what might have been going on in your life at the time that you wrote that particular assignment. Um, maybe they're, um, maybe you're really poorly, maybe, um, you know, maybe there's some outside sort of stresses going on, which perhaps maybe you weren't referencing at your best ability. Um, so that's certainly something that we always suggest that you do. Um, what was the other part of the question, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I, I wonder if you've got any uh, so, some examples. I know when we spoke before, you talked about somebody who was um, being investigated for plagiarising themselves. Yes, that's right. As um, Dee mentioned before, you can self-plagiarise. Um, again, that was that was a new one on me. Um, the student contacted, uh, contacted our service and explained what happened. We, I got to see the letter from the academic conduct officer. Um, and it was because what they had done was referred back to uh, an assignment they had done previously in that module and they'd not referenced themselves um, and they hadn't realized that that was a thing um, and to be honest neither had I um, so we I we both went through the sort of the policies and the procedures of the plagiarism and we were like oh yeah there is it self says self plagiarism um, <laughs> so <laughs> luckily for that student um, it was a sort of gentle telling off of let's not do that again let's just try and get better well hopefully it wasn't a telling off it was a flagging <laughs> off to say that gentle. Uh, the, gentle. this is how you avoid it in the in the future and uh, and of yes. course the reason you can self plagiarize is because you can only be awarded a mark for a piece of work once you can't put the same piece of work in again and get another mark for it exactly. um, so <laughs> so thank you for that Charlotte. that's fantastic so i don't know if uh, jackie or dean want to come in with any um any other comments here uh I'm, I'm interested we haven't really covered the sort of actions dean that we might take so if somebody's referred for an investigation do we immediately kick them out of the university with a big black mark or have we got a sliding scale that uh, that doesn't necessarily end up in that place. What sort of actions uh, are you likely to um, think about? Yeah, it's quite a wide range, actually. And just to touch briefly on what uh, a point Charlotte raised, ultimately, it's about, you know, when somebody's um, potentially investigated for plagiarism, it's about standards across the board. And, you know, as I'm sure every student here today, that, you know, how would they feel if another student was gaining unfair credit and getting a better qualification than they would, for example, etc. So, as much as it's it's catching those people out which as we've said it isn't it's maintaining standards you know you're in an academic community now there, there's reasons why these standards have to be maintained etc and our process seeks to maintain those standards which includes you know potentially taking action as a result so some of those actions um our software reports are reviewed by by a human. So, you know, there, there is actual physical interaction with them. It, it's not just a case of, you know, the computer says refer type thing and it goes off. So it'll be re referred by, um, reviewed by the initial referrer who then determines what appropriate action might be taken here. Um, and it can range from no action. That can be um, no action on the basis of, you know, there is plagiarism here, but actually we're not going to do anything about it. Or there is there is no plagiarism, therefore there's no action mm -hmm. that can be taken. Um, or in those cases where there is a finding of plagiarism. So it's kind of a dual approach, really. Um, has the plagiarism occurred, yes or no? And w therefore, what do we do about it if it has? Um, so if the plagiarism has occurred, the sanctions there can range from, um, you know, a study skills intervention, a, a, an academic intervention, that would be where we're essentially saying, okay, here's how better to reference, here's, here's the concept of referencing and illustrating your source, etc. And having a, a session with a tutor, essentially, an hours session, for example. Um, so it could be something like that, an informal caution. It, we can then go to more the disciplinary level penalties, um, which might include reducing the marks to some degree, usually that would be reducing or removing any credit that has been given for the plagiarized material. And one thing to say on that is that quite often that that's purely to remove credit that would should not otherwise have been given in the first place. So to put the student in the position they ought to have been. But yeah, it's, I certainly wouldn't be worrying about being kicked out of university. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I say that, but yeah. it's not just gonna happen straight away. <laughs> 
<laughs> Absolutely. And I know I've been involved in a lot of sessions with students where we have that one hour and it's the only th only time they ever get referred, only action that's ever taken. It's that study session to help us catch up. Um, I've, I've just been notified that we've got a, a question, Heidi, that uh, is right on topic for this. So, so what's the question that's been raised? Yeah, I think this is a brilliant question that Rachel has asked, um, and it's a really important one just to help clarify things for our students if they're brand new. So Rachel says, if everyone on a module is using the module materials to reference, won't that flag up that everyone's work is plagiarised? So I think it would be great to kind of get that distinction between how that potential um, plagiarizing behavior is being picked up. It's not necessarily a, around, oh, we're all referencing the same person, but it's about using existing work and actually not crediting. So if they're already crediting, it, it's fine, but you're the expert. So if you want to explain that to Rachel and others, that would be really great. So Jackie, are you okay to take that one? Because I think that's, um, that's around the technicalities of how we identify what might be potential plagiarism. <laughs> Excellent question. And I think that's where uh, Dean's point about um, having the human touch is so important in looking at the reports. Um, you will find that many of the assessments that we have are personalised to the student. So you're very much encouraged to put in your own um, experience or um, reflections so that you may use you will be using the module materials but it'd be very much your thoughts your reflections um, and your your take on what you're reading and of course meeting the the, the um the aim of what the uh, assessment is um so again this is where by developing your writing skills and paraphrasing um it it is a skill and it, it does need some time investing in it to develop so uh, what i would really say i mean i know we're going to talk about top tips later but i wouldn't get too um concerned because it it is a skill that you can develop and um it's about sometimes taking a bit of a risk but always using your tutor um to um run ideas past and ensure that what you are writing is um different enough and not likely to trip you up and of course we're not trying to hide this process i know on all of my modules now students have the opportunity to put their assignment through turn it in and get the report themselves so it's not something we're trying to do in the background so we can catch people mm -hmm. out you can actually check yourself to see what score you get and um, if that's available on your module talk to your tutor about it they will explain how to use this and how to avoid it so thank you for that answer jackie and uh, now we're going to look at some of the rules around academic conduct about how we work with other students and how it all fits into assessment and i'm going to go to my guests and i'm going to ask for their top tips but we also want your tips as well so on the ticker that's going across the screen we're asking you to share your tips on how you make sure that the work that you present is clearly your own so give us your hints and tips in the chat and we can go to those so uh, I'm going to start with Charlotte first. So Charlotte, what are your tips for students? So what advice would you give to a student to improve their academic conduct? Um, I think I'll start with a perhaps a more random one. Um, so I recently had a student who contacted us to say that they'd uh, been accused of plagiarism. And what they'd essentially done was used um, an online platform to um, put their ideas down, put their thoughts down, and put, essentially put an essay plan together. It wasn't um, marketed as, as it was going to be widely available to other students. They just put it down. It's almost like a brain dump. That's where all their stuff was going to go. Um, but it turns out this website, um, because this student hadn't paid for a sort of a private um, space on this website, this website was then shared with other students, and other students have since like taken her essay plan and made it their own basically so that is something that I would really be mindful of um, when you have your own essay plans your own thoughts and ideas save them somewhere on word just on your own pc don't make them available online yeah 
Absolutely, and and some of the re the tools that um, that we use are exactly like that. Where uh, the free account is free because it presents uh, the outputs universally. So again, an example of potential um, inadvertent plagiarism and enabling plagiarism, even though that's not your intention. So that's a really good tip there. So Jackie, what? Um, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, what advice would you give to uh, students to help them improve their conduct? To understand the, what is in the academic conduct policy and what does it actually mean? Get to know your tutor. Um, and we know that a huge proportion of our students have um, disabilities, not all of our students actually uh, declare a disability but if you know that you have something in your life that's going to impact on your studies for instance dyslexia mental health difficulties please build that relationship with your tutor so that he or she knows what the possible barriers may be and what could um, help you to uh, develop good academic conduct as well as engaging with the, the materials and the content and meeting the learning outcomes of your module um, and I think that um, having the confidence in you picking up on Charlotte's really important point having the confidence to um, say to other students you know we, we, we've we have to be careful about ensuring that the work that we hand in is our own. Therefore, if you are asked, don't pass on um, the, your own hard work um, for others. And it can be difficult to say no, particularly if your other students are becoming your um, friends. Um, and I think that's there's some of the main um, ideas that are, are really uh, students do find helpful. And not just about disabilities or uh, difficulties of any sort. We all have busy lives. We know that many of our students have got really, really busy lives. And sometimes mm -hmm. you can run out of time to get your work done. And if that is the case, again, speak with your tutor. Don't to be drawn into using a website or even artificial intelligence. We know how much that has come to the fore over less than a year. So we, we at the OU understand how pressured um, all of our students can be with all of the work that they have to fit in, not just their um, academic work. So again, it's back to your tutor, that relationship. Yeah. Make sure that um, they know where, what your situation is, and they can help you because there is lots of help that isn't um, using inappropriate um, sources and support that will end up with you having uh, what is actually an appropriate investigation for academic conduct. Absolutely. And uh, the, the feedback we give, we, we are always very specific in our feedback on the um, in the area of uh, citing your work and, and in referencing. Uh, we did have a comment come through about if you're saving your own work, make sure you back it up. And um, I'll throw in one of my top tips uh, just as we go through. Uh, every student with the OU has a Microsoft um, 365 account. You're given one when you start. You've got an immense amount of storage there in the cloud. You've got one terabyte of storage. Use it. That's probably the safest place to store your work. Um, Computers can fail, they can blow up, they can get stolen, but the cloud is a nice, safe place that you can always get to when you need to. So that would be uh, my tip there. So Dean, we're gonna to come to you for your, your tips about um, improving academic conduct. What would you say to students? Um, probably two key ones, really. Number one is, um, I know you can't sort of make people be confident, but do try to have confidence in using material. You know, quite often the student's response to avoiding plagiarism is, you know, not wanting to actually go to sources and, and not want to over rely on sources. That's not the issue. You know, go ahead. We want you to engage with different sources in order to develop your understanding. The issue is, is when you then illustrate that usage. So do try mm -hmm. to have the confidence to, to actually engage with material. Um, 
the, the key here is illustrate that usage. And I think the way I try to envision that is if I'm writing my assignment, I'm typing it or, or handwriting it, whatever it may be, every time I'm looking away from my page, then I'm going to another source essentially. So at that point, you know, note your sources down, note the links down, put it within your draft, for example. At any given time where I'm having to move my head to look for material elsewhere is when I'm potentially drawing on material from another source. So ensure that that aspect of your work is then recognized. That's a really good try. I like that one. If you're not looking at the screen typing, you're using somebody, potentially using somebody else's work. Uh, I also like the one about write your sources down as you go through. Uh, I didn't do that when I was studying. I I was one of those students that tended to try and bring all the references together at the end. Oh, nightmare. It, it got to the point where it was taking me almost as long to check back on the references as it did to write the assignment. Uh, I very quickly learned, keep a log of your references as you go through. Um, and that way it makes it so much easier when you get to the end. Um, so if we can have us all back on the screen, I've, I've got a question I'd like to um, to throw to the panel. Uh, we encourage students to um, collaborate and we encourage uh, having study buddies and study sessions with others. Any tips on making sure that when we have those really useful, really helpful sessions that we avoid um, falling into this trap of potentially uh, a potential misconduct. So I'm looking for hands to go up. Anybody who'd like to take that one? <laughs> Nobody yet. <laughs> go on then, Dean. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a bit of a, a fine line really between, you know, where does study buddy collaboration breach the rules kind of thing essentially mm -hmm. um even the nature of collaboration there are times where you will be instructed to collaborate um but it's still important in those situations again when you are using material from the other person persons then you are appropriately acknowledging that and referencing that so you know we actively encourage students to develop um you know social relationships working relationships etc studying relationships and and sharing you know good practice um there's good guidance on, on the website so hopefully some uh, material and links will be available for that but it's when it gets to the point where um it it's encroached into the work being um a form of the, the collective rather than your own work or indeed when it is drawing on other people's views and ideas and work that you are appropriately acknowledging that so certainly encourage people to, to get together um mm -hmm. but maintaining the actual output as your own or recognizing when it isn't yeah, and I, and I think it's that level of discussion, isn't it? It's uh, what are the arguments that we might look at here? What are the, you know, what do you think of this idea? What do you think of the cost? Rather than what are you writing? So having that debate, having that discussion is really useful. Um, it's definitely a key part of learning, but it's stopping short of, well, I've written this, what do you think? And I think it, that's where, for me, um, as a tutor that's, that's marking. I want to see that active debate in the tutor group forum or in the study group. But then I want there to be a, a clear gap between the discussion and what the student actually writes. So you come back, Dean, yeah? Yeah, just and kind of touching on a question that was raised earlier, and apologies, I can't remember the name of the person that raised it, but about if we're all writing from the module materials, wouldn't you expect to see everybody plagiarising, in essence, was the question. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, there is indeed a difference. You know, if, if you are writing about the same topic, the same, I'm from a legal background, so the same case, we would expect to see certain material in there. Um, it's when it breaches that and goes to what we wouldn't expect to see, and this works with a kind of a study buddy relationship, we'd expect to see the same, you know, content addressing the question. We wouldn't expect to say, see the same structure, flow, order of points, the same exact sentence used, for example. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's the sharing of ideas, how you might, you know, tackle something rather than, you know, how you physically get down to addressing the, the response to that question. Okay. Uh, I'm going to bring Jackie back in for a second, because I know Jackie needs to leave this as a mo in a moment. So and we really appreciate your input, Jackie. And uh, just wonder if you've got a, a comment you wanted to make before we let you get off to your next meeting. Um, thank you, Rob. I would just again say, please um, build your skills up and invest that time. 
bear in mind that we really don't want to um, be referring students for in investigation into their academic conduct because it is really distressing for students but also for staff we just don't like doing it we want students to be able to feel that they can submit their own work and get that credit and that's what we have to do to ensure that standards are being met and that we are all getting the credit towards our degree that we've earned by our own work because as humans we we want fairness don't we and it has been touched on that um students are actually quite can be quite harsh on each other if they know that another student has basically cheated and by cheating I mean deliberately copying somebody else's work another student's work going to an essay mill or perhaps using uh, artificial intelligence which um, incidentally is actually relatively easy to identify if that has been um, used so I just want to reassure you that we want to be as supportive as possible and work together to prevent anyone being um, referred for investigation, particularly when it's still the process of developing your writing skills and referencing skills, because it can really damage your confidence. And I, I've been there where I've had feedback about my referencing not being as good as it could be when I was a student. And you, it's better to have the that feedback within your assignment um, rather than ending up uh, being investigated um, inappropriately. So I hope I haven't scared people too much. I'm just trying to give the two sides of the story. Yeah, and now hopefully, Jackie, so, well, I, I think the message today is coming through very clearly. It's basically, we're there to help, help there to develop your skills and help you to improve. The only way somebody's going to get further down the line to have a real problem is if they don't take on board the help and advice that they've been given. So I'd just like to say thank you again for joining us and uh, I really appreciate you fitting us into your, your busy day and we look forward to you in a, a session in future. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, and thank you students and everybody. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. So I'm going to get some, some feedback from Heidi now, um, see if anybody's popped any tips or if they've got any more questions for us. So Heidi, what's being said in the chat? I love this um, comment from Aurora just now. Um, I think we've lost Jackie now, but she says, can I give Jackie a fiver to stay off the radar in case I ever forget a reference? <laughs> so uh, that one did make me smile. Um, so advice and tips then. So Ian says, I've done the referencing course with the library and it was very good and it put my mind to rest. Um, and Alicia said, after this, I'll try referencing um, the referencing course with the library. So perhaps if one of the team could put the link to that in the chat, that would be really helpful because there's some people talking about that. Um, Iona, in terms of tips and advice, I take note of exactly where I'm getting the information from. Then when I write the TMA, I add after any citation or thought where I'm referring to anything with a highlighted page number or source name, then referencing is simple. I agree with that. I used to be terrible with my referencing. I used to think I'm going to leave it to the very end. I'd procrastinate and then yeah. I'd finish my TMA and my assignment. And then I'd be like, oh, I've got to spend like another day going through now and finding all these referencing. So I started forcing myself to put it into a spreadsheet and then it was easier then to, um, to add out on the end. And I'm sure people are aware of this, but it's something I only discovered very recently. Obviously in Excel, you can um, get things in alphabetical order really easily, but you can do the same on Word. So when I submitted my giant dissertation at the end of my master's, which I think was 10,000 words, I just kind of put all of the um, references in there, all in whatever order I wanted. And then you can just sort it all. And it just automatically does it for you. And that just really put my mind at ease because I'm terrible at putting things in, in order. So that might be a, a good tip there. And June says, I tend to, when writing assignments, reference as I go, yeah, put the reference list on a sticky note. Definitely. We've got lots of love for sticky notes in the chat. <laughs> so I can double check them before adding to my reference list at the end of my assignment. Now, I do have a question. There were um, a couple of people which said they really would like this one to be asked. And I know that we've got plenty of time for questions mm -hmm. at the end. So this is quite a quick one, Rob, if I can just yep. quickly put this um, to the panel. Rebecca says, is it possible to have too many references um, cited in your work assignment? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I'll let Dean answer that and I'll come back with an answer as well. So, Dean, um, in, in, your, in your role as a tutor as well, do you have do you ever criticise too many references? 
Um, I think this is one of those instances where there's a bit of a separation between um, good academically and good academic conduct. So, for example, and I, again, I say this somewhat tentatively, in theory, somebody could co copy and paste their entire assignment, quote it, reference it properly, and it's not academic misconduct, but it's not very good academically. Um, mm -hmm. Don't do that. Um, that's the disclaimer. <laughs> and, <point. laughs> and similarly with, with this kind of question, you know, the, the idea of too many references, if, if everything that you are quoting from other material sources is, is a proper reference, that's fine. I would maybe question academically on, you, you gain the credit for, work, for your own words, your own understanding and interpretation. So drawing on a resource to then show, for example, your critical analysis of that is where you're gaining the credit. You're not gaining the credit for necessarily copying that quote. So to what extent, if you're drawing on so many references, are you removing your opportunity with word counts and things like that, for example, to actually gain your own credit for showing your understanding? So in principle, reference everything you use, but use wisely. Yeah, and I think my answer is very similar to yours. And it's the, it's the point that the reason you're using sources is to build up an argument, to build up a point that you're making. If your point is just purely made up of sources, then you're not developing it, you're not proving it. So um, for me, a, a better assignment is one that will have a good range of sources that clearly support the argument or the point that's being made, rather than just lots and lots of sources which are, come together in a mishmash and not a very structured way. Uh, there's definitely a... <laughs> a case where you can have too few um, and there isn't uh, I haven't got a magic number of how many is the right number the the answer is a really unhelpful enough you need enough sources to support the point or the argument or the analysis that you're carrying out um, and they need to be referenced correctly so it's uh, <laughs> My students, and my students and my tutor group always groan when I say enough <laughs> because it's not a very precise um, number. But I know when I look at a piece of work whether there's enough. And it's it's difficult to say up front. Uh, I think we'll, uh, what we're going to do... Yeah, we'll have one more question on this one, Heidi, and then we're going to go to a short break and then we'll come back with a proper question and answer session. Okay, yeah. So um, just to say, Leisha, I am, I promise you I'm going to put your question um, to mm -hmm. the panel in the next session. And Dale, your question was quite similar to Leisha's. So I just want to make sure that we've got a bit more time to answer those meteor questions. So that's the only reason I haven't put it to the panel. Yeah. I'm being reminded in the chat to ask, and I, I promise I will. It's it's very much on my radar. Um, <laughs> they so want the questions question. answered, Heidi. <laughs> they do. They do. They're eager. Don't blame them. Which is good. Um, this is so, what we want. <laughs> yeah. So um, a great question here from Sophie, and it was one that I really had to grab with when I first did, first started studying with the OU. The question Sophie asks is, does OU module content have an author? Emma said, I'd love an explanation on the module content author point raised above by Sophie. And I think that question is all about referencing in terms of do we reference the OU? Do we reference the author? Like, how does it work? But we know that the module content does have an author. And if you can talk us through in the time that we've got on how we would reference, that would be great. OK, so this isn't um, a big session on how to reference. We do have sessions in Student Hub Live that look at that. So I'm not going to go too much into the details on the, the, the practicalities. However, when it comes to who the author is, um, sometimes the author is clearly stated and sometimes it's not. And if the author is stated, you should use the author's name. If the author is not stated, then use the Open University as the author. And that is the very simple rule of thumb. So if you have printed materials from the OU, it's quite often you will see who wrote that section or who wrote that book. That book. And that's the name that will you, you will use. Sometimes it's not so obvious if you're using the, the website version of the module. It's not always so obvious who the author is. Um, so you can then default to using the Open University as the author. What are the questions that are being asked and what are the most pressing ones? Lovely. OK, so Leisha has been waiting very patiently to have her question answered. So thank you so much for your patience, Leisha. So I've got two questions that are quite similar. So I want to try and combine them. So just bear with me here because there's quite a lot of um, information here. So Leisha says, if a group of students are communicating in a WhatsApp group, 
Is it okay for them to share the notes they've written about a module they're studying with others on the course? Is that forbidden or is that okay? And the reason that she asks is because Leisha has been advised that in the code of conduct, it says not to share module information but does not specify personal notes. Now, Dale has gone on and kind of expanded this a little bit more. So I want to combine the two. Dale says, just to clarify, I'm just trying to get a clear response. You're saying it's okay to put non-TMA answers for feedback in the tutor forum for other students to see and comment on, but it's not okay to put non-TMA answers in student social media groups for other students to see and comment on. I understand why they don't want you to discuss TMA answers with students. That makes absolute sense. But I think Dale is, um, says, I, I have a problem with discussing answers to some of the activities to not only check if fellow students have understood the questions or content, but also to help students if they're struggling. So that's why I said it's a bit of a meaty one there. So I'm not sure who wants yeah. to, to tackle it. <laughs> well, well, we'll come to uh, Dean first um, to, to tackle that. And then, uh, Charlotte, if we can get you set up to think about what advice you give to students when working together, because we want to encourage that working together, but how to work together and stay within the rules. So Dean first, please. Um, yeah, so again, a bit of a disclaimer is it's kind of one of those grayish areas where it's there isn't a fine line on at what point do, do you then go into you know breaching the rules regulations etc um the first thing to say is going back to an early point of any kind of collaboration you know it, whether you're instructed to do that or not you're always recognizing the involvement and work of others um insofar as to what extent that becomes um where you should be recognizing other people's involvement i said before about you know the, the idea of having a study buddy relationship you know we encourage you to do consult um you know share your thoughts and ideas on on the general assignment the question how you might approach it etc i personally would say that if you if you're getting to the realms of sharing notes even in draft form um that's something to for me to avoid um because you number one run the risk then of it's the recipient if they use that material and that then relates to your assignment how, how has that match come about has it been as a result of sharing work etc um if you're you know if, if in theory the sharing of notes is to the extent of discussing and addressing the task um that's probably something that's you know quite plausible quite feasible and, and you know we'd encourage you to do that it's where your it, it's where any, anything that might form the content of your assignment um is is that they're not recognized or illustrated for the usage or that where you're sharing that and you're enabling somebody else to be able to plagiarize that um mm. I, I don't know if that specifically addresses that part part of the question no i, th I think that's a good point i think if if in your notes you've potentially got sentences that you've created <laughs> which could then go into your assignment and somebody else uses it, that's definitely the sort of thing that could be flagged up. Um, so I think it's, it's be careful is the answer. Um, if you get too close to you sharing your thoughts that could then be used in the answer, that's when you might need to defend it. So, But we do like students to share ideas. So it's, is that not... Oh, sorry, I thought you were raising your hand again then, Dean, to, go, to come back into that one, sorry. Yeah. Um, so yeah, share your thoughts, have those conversations. We don't want to stop students talking to each other, absolutely not. And we encourage you to talk about approaches and argue different points of view and get different perspectives. It's just be careful if you're sharing anything that could then appear in somebody's work. Uh, I'm gonna to come to Charlotte for a second. And Charlotte, I just want to know from the USA point of view, what's your advice on working together in study groups and and do you give advice on how to avoid uh, crossing the line are there any points that you bring out um thanks rob so i think um similar to what dean was saying and what yourself was saying um whatsapp groups are an excellent source um or what's that sort of social media forums and groups are a really good source to get other people sort of maybe um opinions perhaps of the assignment question um because sometimes some assignment questions can be taken from can be seen from different angles so it's always interesting to see what other people think what the assignment question is but yeah like you said you've got to be really careful about crossing the line um in terms of sort of advice that usa gives um we're usually here to sort of support the student through their perhaps a academic misconduct case um 
it's something that it's all just about being very careful it's all again like you said we want to um, encourage students to collaborate together to um, form um, friendships as such as well um, but you've just got to be really careful that what you say um, your ideas perhaps can't be taken by uh, another student to then be passed off as their own um, mm -hmm. that's probably just just be very just be very careful <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And steer clear of anything that could end up in an answer, potentially. Uh, I'd just like to say, just make a comment about WhatsApp as well. So um, you said there you can, uh, WhatsApp groups are really useful for picking apart questions and understanding what questions are. As a tutor, what I'd like to see, though, is using the tutor group forum to ask those questions. And the reason I say that is that I like to be able to <laughs> check that what's being said is actually correct. Um, if a student submits a, um, an answer to a question and they've completely misunderstood it, they can't use the defence, well, the WhatsApp group said this. If the WhatsApp group gets it wrong, you're, you're going to end up losing marks. If you ask that um, question in the tutor group forum and discuss it to students, it gives me the opportunity as your tutor to perhaps head off any misconceptions or any poor advice. So I always um, suggest that if it's a TMA or exam related question for some clarity, involve your tutor in that discussion or make sure the tutor's involved because not everybody gets it right. It doesn't matter how good the student is, there's a chance you might be getting poor advice and um, we're there to help. So we're not suggesting don't discuss it, just put it in a place where uh, we can be involved. So Heidi, hopefully we've uh, we've answered that question. Um, what's the next one we've got to look at? Yep, hopefully Dale and um, Leisha are happy with that very detailed response. So thank you so much, everyone. So um, Sophie asked a question. Now this one is a little bit in jest, but I think there's actually a really, really valid point here. So Sophie says, can you submit an assignment, then quickly email your tutor to tell them to ignore it and you submit again if you forgot to check your references? And then she's put a laughing emoji at the end. But actually, I know there are ways that you can resubmit if, as long as it's before the deadline. So I thought that might be quite oh. good advice that we give to students as well. So uh, if you don't mind, guys, I'll take this one because this is advice I give all the time. So first of all, when you submit an assignment uh, through the electronic system, uh, you are allowed to resubmit, I think it's five times, it might even be more than that, but you're allowed to resubmit several times before the cutoff date. So if you find you've m made an error, just resubmit. Uh, if you are planning to be away um, and you're worried that you won't get an assignment in, actually send an early, an early version of your assignment in as a just in case. And then you can always resubmit afterwards. So if you think that you've got a good one, but actually I want to do a bit of work on it, but I might not get the time, submit the good one and then submit the, the further one later on. So your tutor will always mark the last one that was submitted. So, so the, you can't send a note to your tutor and say, please do version three, ignore versions four and five, because they won't see versions four or five, they will just see the last one. So the last one you send is there. And whilst you're submitting your assignments, Remember that you, have, you are ticking the box that says this is all my own work and I've checked it's the correct format and I've checked it to the correct file. Don't just tick those boxes as a matter of course because that's you saying to the university, I'm taking responsibility that this is my work and the correct file. You can't come back later and say, oh, well, I just ticked the box. It wasn't the right file at all there's a little option to download your submission when you've submitted your assignments. Always do this. Once you've submitted it, download the submission and check it's what you meant. That's the right time to then submit the right one. I do a lot of work with students where they submit the wrong assignment for whatever reason. It might be an early draft. If you're not very good at marking, labeling your files, um, get into a good habit. So if you're doing a business degree, you will have six TMA ones by the time you get to the end of your degree. If you just label TMA one as TMA one, 
How do you know you've sent the right one in? So when you're saving your files, TMA1 for B100 final. If you label it as that in your final edition, you know what you're uploading. So a slightly lengthy answer to that question, but yes, you can resubmit if you've forgotten your referencing or if you want to add something. Um, even if it's just a, a just-in-case submission. So Heidi, next question. <laughs> Yeah, so I know that we said that this isn't, we're not going to give specific details about how people reference, of course, within this session. But this question has come up a couple of times, Rob, and I know that you'll be able to answer it quite quickly. Um, so this is Dale and Sophia who've asked this question, and it's all around referencing yourself, which we talked about earlier so that you're not plagiarizing yourself. Um, yep. So if you've done some work that links to another assignment, um, essentially, how do you quote and reference those previous assignments? Is that something that we can kind of pick up on quite, quite in a concise period of time? Yeah, so Dan, is that something you can talk through? So referencing yeah. yourself in the previous assignment. Yeah, so again, without going too far into the technicalities of the, the how to reference, one of, the, one of the parts I always say to students is when it comes to academic conduct, um, the starting point is, are you showing the reader that this came from somewhere else? So if you don't actually technically reference yourself or another source um, correctly, you know, if the reader can tell oh, they're trying to show me this came from X, you know, a separate issue is, oh, here's how to do that properly. So the, the primary starting point for me would be acknowledge that work in some way. How to technically do that, um, I'd, I'd, I mean, as a, as, a, as a formal answer, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. Um, I, I personally do that as, um, as you would any other reference, you know, and acknowledge yeah. the respective TMA. Um, so I, I I say I'm not sure insofar as, well, I, you know, I don't know the year, et cetera, and things like that, the author. However, you have done your referencing style within that assignment, I know that can vary from modules and schools, then I would apply that in, in the same format to your respective TMA module, or if, if indeed it's another institution, it could be an, an article or report you've done anywhere in theory. So you're acknowledging it in the same way, but the principle being you are acknowledging it. Yeah. And I, I... I think we don't want students to get panicked that they've got to get it in exactly the right format, that we're, we're out if your italics aren't in the right place or your brackets aren't in the right place. Academic conduct is all about making sure it's clear to the reader where the source comes from. The actual detail of how you've referenced and what the reference looks like, that, that style and formatting, we can work on that. Um, so a common comment from me to my students is you're referencing the right things in the right places, just not quite in the right way. Let's work on it. Uh, and that, for me, is the ideal place at year one where we're developing those formatting skills. Uh, the other thing I quite often put in is saying uh, it's not clear where this came from. This should have been a reference or you should have told me where this came from or is this your own thoughts or did you pick it up from the module? So we give lots of advice on that as we go through. Uh, I just had a comment from Tina flash up on the screen about uh, your tutor can pick up your assignment early. Uh, yes, they can, Tina, but the rules to tutors is we mark the last one submitted before the, the cutoff date. Um, if you, if you are submitting multiple ones, it's quite nice as a tutor to know there's another one coming so we don't mark ahead of time. Um, but, oh, look at that. <laughs> that's that's my light. Uh, Angela's laughing in the background now. Light's just fallen off and bonked me on the head. Um, but, yeah, so if, um, if you do submit another one, it's a good idea to tell your tutor, but we should always be marking the last one. Okay, so... Heidi, another question while I put my light back up. Well, whoever put that question in your in your notes there, Rob, I'm annoyed with now because they've just stolen the question that I was going to ask you, and it's because <laughs> it was part of a broader question. I'll I just thought, ask oh. the broader question then. Yes, I will do. Okay, so I think that was Tina that asked that question. And actually, that's really interesting because I had no idea. I thought that all tutors waited until the deadline before any of them started marking. So Tally says, what if a tutor starts marking assignments submitted before the cutoff? If so, they, they may mark an earlier submission. Christine said, I read somewhere that if I submit an assignment early, 
and then the tutor has the right to mark that early, then that's the version that they will use. Is that correct? And then Pauline says, surely some tutors collect them before the cutoff, though. So I, I know we touched on it there, but can we just clarify, like, once and for all the process for, for all of our slightly concerned students then in the audience? Yeah, so um, because we are busy, we will pick things up early. Um, it depends what your tutor said as well. So what I normally say to my students in the, my welcome message is, I may pick the assignments up and start marking them early. If you intend to resubmit, let me know. So that's what I put it. It's not an official thing, but the official thing from the university is you are allowed to resubmit up to the cutoff date. And as your tutor, you uh, we should mark the last one submitted before. <laughs> Bit of advice though, don't annoy your tutor by sending something in really early, then sending something in on the cutoff date without letting them know. It's got nothing to do with policy. It's more to do with the fact you don't want an annoyed tutor marking your work. So it's just a sensible thing to do rather than anything else. So it's, um, yeah, the, the OU policy is the last one submitted before the cutoff date will be the one marked. But it's, it's just about that communication and courtesy because we do like, you know, we've got a lot of work to do to turn the assignments round. And I do know a lot of tutors like to get started early. You definitely won't get the results back before the cutoff date, but some tutors will mark before. So it's it's that relationship with your tutor, build on that. Um, and, and if you let us know, that's right. And in a lot of cases, the, the things that you change are, are really quite um, minor polishing things. It's not often that we'll get a resubmission where it's a, a major change. Um, okay, any other questions? I'm quite conscious we've not had Charlotte on for a while. So any questions we can put to Charlotte? Oh, well, you've just put me on the spot with that one. I don't know if this one's going to be <laughs> completely uh, relative to Charlotte, so I do apologise. But um, this is a question that's come through from Tony. Um, so Tony says, is Mendeley OU approved? Now, I had to Google Mendeley. Mm. We've had quite a few conversations around Grammarly in the chat. Some people saying they love it. Some saying they're really not keen. I found Grammarly amazing, actually, um, really, really useful. So, um, yeah, Mendeley um, is about avoiding plagiarism um, when writing. Um, so is that something that is approved by the OU? you are we happy for students to be using Mendeley now this one's definitely going to have to go to uh, to Dean um, and it was a question I had Dean the fact that uh, not just Mendeley but reference generators in in general do we like them or not and the reason I ask that is because we have a very specific style at the OU we use Harvard referencing as approved by cite them right so do you find there's a problem when students are using these reference generators, reference management tools? Um, yeah, there's probably two points again here. And I feel like I've maybe said this, you know, the, the common denominator is ultimately it's referencing the work from another source, you know, mm -hmm. before we go into the technicalities of how you do that, etc. Obviously, in, in different module schools, you'll have the way of referencing, as I kind of alluded to before. So as long as it's consistent with that, um, as far as what's approved, what isn't, then uh, th there isn't there isn't a clear line on yes you can you cannot use use this and that that's like using any source i think you know in theory you can use any source out there however credible that source is academically you may get credit or not for using credible or not credible sources but in theory if you use material from another source and you've referenced it academic conduct wise you're fine sort of thing you know let's look at that separately whether you're drawing on appropriate sources um in any study certainly in legal study you know are you using the actual laws hold resources of England, etc the relevant act legislation or are you going to wikipedia well there's a difference there um but the second point is i think you know don't do yourself a disservice we've said before about the nature of referencing an academic not being a skill and a skill to be developed um yes get assistance in in trying to do that and use the resources in in how to construct a reference um but try to actually learn that skill as you go along you know don't have something do it for you because you actually miss out and do a disservice to yourself i think in in, in that respect so to kind of catch all that acknowledge the sources primarily um nothing is necessarily approved or not um, it's whether you are acknowledging the source and doing that properly and appropriately, um, but mm -hmm. do try to yourself gain the study and the skill of referencing and using credible sources. 
And you've actually hit on one of my bugbears as a tutor, where students are using these reference generators. And because the OU is behind um, a password protected system, if you use some of these generators to generate your online references, it basically gives you the link to the sign-in page for the OU. It's not a reference at all. It's just a link to the sign-in page. And where that happens, I quite often go back to the student and say, look, I don't have a problem with you using something to generate your references, but at least I expect you to be able to recognize when it's kicked out rubbish. So something that's just taken me to the Open University signing page is um, as part of their online reference is not an online reference. And for me, that's where the skill comes in. If you're using these tools, being able to recognize when it's telling you something that just doesn't make sense. So I'm going to finish up because Charlotte, I'm very conscious that uh, <laughs> Dean's answered most questions. I'm going to give you um, just a minute just to say uh, something about how students can get in touch with USA. If they do want some advice, if they do feel they, they need some advice, how do they get in touch with you and um, the, uh, the best times to do that? Okay, lovely. Um, so we have a website, um, I think it's OUStudents.com. Um, hopefully it can go in the chat somehow or on the web page afterwards. Um, so if you look on our website, it's all um, we've got a whole section about student advice and the individual representation service. Um, it will give you some help um, information around plagiarism and also the other things that we can help and support with, such as um, complaints or uh, appeals, um, academic appeals. Um, there's also a way of uh, appealing a plagiarism uh, case if that's what you wanted to do. So we're here. Um, it's myself and my other colleague, uh, Chibway. We both work part time, but over the week we are we're always in. One of us is always in. Um, we're here to help and support as needed. And am I right in assuming that all students of the OU are automatically members of the OU Students Association? They don't yes. need to join. You're automatically members. Yep, automatically members. That's right, Rob. So, thank you for that. And thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Dean, for your time today. It's been really helpful. And hopefully um, we've allayed some of the fears and uh, people are feeling more comfortable about developing their academic practice. So, Heidi, as always, last comments to you. Um, last thoughts from the chat. Sorry, yeah, just lots of engagement in the chat today, lots of people and talking. So hopefully, as you said, we have been able to allay some fears. I know some people said that they were feeling a little bit anxious, a bit concerned. Um, so hopefully we've been able to put your mind at ease. And I'm sorry that I wasn't able to put all of the questions to the panelists. I know our, our students have been really, really enthusiastic. So I'm so sorry if we didn't get time to answer your question, but thank you so much. And we hopefully will see you at the next event. Thank you very much. And to talk about the next events, we have a few coming up. Um, so we've got a number of workshops coming in now. It's a little way to our um, uh, next live event in the studio. So we've got um, academic conduct. Oh, no, that's today. <laughs> Look at there. there I'm reading the calendar. I can't even figure out which day it is. We've got some sessions looking at essay planning and academic writing coming up. So these are all booked, but the, you can still put your name on the waiting list. Um, we've got sessions coming up on creative problem solving. And then in November, we've got a session on support and well-being for student carers. Uh, also in November, we've got a session on power reading and busting myths around academic conduct. So if you want to see the events that are coming up, please go to the Student Hub Live website. They're all listed there. Uh, if you want to make sure you don't miss out when the tickets are arranged to go to these things, subscribe. That's how to make sure you get your tickets in advance. And of course, we've got the feedback form. So there should be a link to the feedback form on the website and in the chat. We really do like, uh, well, we need your feedback. We need to know what you want us to talk about. And we need to justify the, the time that's spent bringing these sessions to you. So tell us what you want to talk about. Tell us the things that you like, the things you didn't like, and we'll make sure we bring those in in the future. So thank you, everyone, for taking part. It's been a great morning, and I look forward to seeing you all at future events. So have a good day. Bye-bye.